Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to revisit an album from 1971, <coughs> one of my favourites, Ram, from Paul and Linda McCartney. And the reason I'm doing this, among other reasons, is firstly, I've, I haven't done a proper review of this since I did one years and years ago in a sort of dingy lit bedroom at my parents' house. Um, so that wasn't the best video I've ever made, and I think it's just time it's always good to reappraise important albums and I've been reading this superb book which Dave Costello gave me for my birthday and I'm about halfway through it and I will do a proper review when I all the way when I finished it and it's just a superb book it really is incredibly well written and well researched and uh, for the most part illuminating informative and uh, it's a bloody good read I'm really enjoying it um, so more to say about that and also some stuff I hadn't I mean you'd, you'd think after 40 plus years of being a Beatles fan there's not much you can learn but you one is amazed reading a book like that uh, lots of stuff I hadn't heard um, just off the top of my head I mean there's some the David Wig interview with John Lennon in 1971 there's the bit which was released on the Beatles tapes um, the, the album and then there's some extra bits in that book uh, where David Wigg asks him about how do you sleep and he's and Paul and John says I met Paul for dinner last night and uh, talked about it and that's I wish David Wigg I know he talked about it but he never did it I wish he'd released the unedited interviews maybe there's sort of copyright reasons or sort of the other the Beatles object to it or something but it would be great Anyway, I digress. Also, another thing, just uh, probably before I forget to mention it, George Harrison, very dismissive of Wildlife when it came out in 1971, started off by saying, well, it's not a very good album. To be kind to Paul, it's not a very good album. And then he said, it's unbelievable, um, basically saying how bad it is. And it's a poor album. Even if Wings were an unknown group, it would be poor. But, but from Paul, it's doubly poor. He really lays into it. I'd never heard that before. It was an interview round about the time, December 71. Anyway, they uh, obviously have covered the period when Paul McCartney's recording Ram, and it's just fascinating the fact that he's in New York. And actually, I was thinking, oh, well, that's interesting. He's the first solo Beatle to record an album outside the UK. But actually, he's the second. Um, unless you count George Harrison mucking around doing electronic sounds which I don't really count um, and he didn't even write that bit anyway the the bit he nicked from that um, uh, what's it called Moog synthesizer guy um, anyway Bo Coops of Blues from Ringo I think was the first album recorded outside of the UK and he recorded that in Nashville in the summer of 1970 and this is McCartney in October through to Christmas of 1970 recording in New York, returning to New York in February and March and recording more and then doing some overdubs in Hollywood, Los Angeles. Um, so very interesting that he recorded outside of the UK and um, one of the reasons it says in the book is he didn't want to casually bump into John or George at EMI studios. Um, if he'd, For example, if he'd recorded Ram there, he might well have bumped into John or George literally in the corridor because they were recording both of them solo albums in London at that time. Anyway, so um, what's interesting, I think Ram, it's maybe not, a lot of fans say it's his best album. It, it, maybe it's not my favourite of his, but I do think you could make a case for it being the most interesting. Um, it was quite a brave album to make. He, he just suffered pretty poor critical response to the McCartney album. He was being blamed by more or less the entire world for the Beatles' breakup. So he had his back up against the wall. His, he'd fallen out with his ex-bandmates. He was on the verge of having to take them to court to dissolve the Beatles' partnership, to get rid of Alan Klein. Um, so there's a fair amount of angst. Uh, I think that's the best word I could use, angst, in this album. Um, He's tense, he's a bit nervous, he's a bit low on self-confidence, you could argue, and he's having a bit of a dig, albeit 
an oblique dig at his fellow band, ex-bandmates, um, some of which was legit and some of it was actually not even true and just imagined on the, in the case of in John Lennon's head he just imagined a few things which weren't actually there which I'll come to but um, the overwhelming feel, feeling from the album apart from the angst I just talked about is is one of home and family same as the McCartney album and one of just being in the heart of the country and uh, just living the simple life and uh, nothing wrong with that but did it present an irksome image for Paul McCartney at the time when uh, maybe sort of rock music was becoming more seriously th thought of as an art form and a lot of fans and the newly formed music press, people like Rolling Stone and magazines like that, were perhaps looking for deeper meanings in the, the output of artists and uh, for Paul to just come out with a, an album about love and family and being in the countryside but perhaps sort of went against that and it was certainly the antithesis of the efforts from jo the early solo efforts from John Lennon and George Harrison um, which were sort of I would describe as heavy in terms of they had they came with a message whether it was a re religious message or some kind of therapeutic message or bearing of one's soul and um, you know very getting down to the nitty gritty, you know, not mucking around writing love songs. We're talking about John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band and All Things Was Past. We're talking about two of the most sensational, sort of honest albums, and albeit very different in their, in, in their own respects from each other, but a world away from where Paul McCartney was at. And, um, but having said that, Paul McCartney was more or less in the same position as Bob Dylan was at this period in terms of Bob Dylan wasn't putting out any kind of message to the world. He wasn't dabbling in politics, albeit uh, apart from a single called George, Jack George Jackson from 71. But in 1970, he was putting out, you know, Self Portrait and New Morning, which is just basically inoffensive country music albums, love songs, and a lot of them cover songs. Um, he got a lot of stick for that from the music press, but there's nothing wrong with it. And I, I think Paul was a, a victim of that at the time. I think with hindsight, people are inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, so what if he wasn't dabbling in politics or coming out with the religious thoughts? You know, he was being honest and he was showing that family came first to him and family is an, just an important value as any kind of political value that one could a spouse and there's nothing wrong with that um, but it is interesting to compare the first or so almost the first solo singles from the four of them which came out round about the same time you had another day from Paul so that's a song nice melodic song about a, a lonely woman written in the third party George my sweet lord we all know about that about Harry Krishna and hallelujah um, a song to God, Power to the People, the beginning of J John's political activism phase, and Ringo Starr singing about peace and love <laughs> all those years ago, even back then, It Don't Come Easy, one of his best solo efforts. So interesting, and they sort of competed against each other chart-wise. George won that particular battle at the time. I think Paul came, Paul and Ringo sort of came roughly second equal, and John brought up the rear because it don't come easy, I think got to number two, or maybe it was number four. Maybe, maybe Paul is slightly more successful with Another Day, number two. Um, so the reviews for this album, Ram, this is my Greek copy, by the way, which is interesting because it's on the Green Apple, as the original US and uh, UK copies were, but this is the Greek Apple, which is always nice to see an alternative apple there. And... I've got several copies of Ram, but the first one I ever picked up in the late 70s was on the Capitol label. And so when I finally d discovered this album on Apple, I was quite surprised. I said, I didn't know it was on Apple, um, but it was. He was, con he was contracted to the Apple label at the time, but not very happy to release stuff with Apple splashed all over it, and certainly not with Alan Klein's name or Abco splashed all over it. So the reviews were extremely harsh, um, famously Rolling Stone saying you can't even like or dislike this record it's so unbelievably 
inconsequential and monumentally irrelevant is how it described it. And it's quite an amusing retrospective review. I mean, retrospectively to look at that review, but obviously it's a little harsh to put it mildly. Um, but at the time, one was comparing, if I was, one was a music critic in 1971, or if one was a student at university sort of sharing recent albums with your friends, Ram was up against some very stiff competition. I mean, one thinks of Led Zeppelin Four, Sticky Fingers, Imagine, and Medal from Pink Floyd. I mean, just, just so Sticky Fingers from the Stones, Imagine from John Lennon, um, and Who's Next from the Who. So, against that, it it may have paled into an, in by comparison in terms of not being as hip, and obviously Linda being sharing the vocals probably took a bit of getting used to for the fans, but I think she does a great job. And Elton John is on record saying he loves the harmonies between Paul and Linda on this record. So that was interesting. Um, musicians, he had the pick of the cream of the crop of New, New York session musicians, Dave Spinoza, who's interesting, his name was spelt wrong on the on the album sleeve. Uh, Hugh McCracken, Denny Sywell, um, Denny Sywell went on to join Wings. Hugh McCracken was invited to join Wings, but had a, a child in the US from his first marriage and didn't want to leave the US, so quite understandably said no. But Paul was apparently quite upset with him at the time for saying no. Um, are they in, so all of them fine musicians. Dave Pizzanoza would go on to play with John Lennon on Mind Games. Hugh McCracken would go on to play with Paul Simon, still crazy after all these years, One Trick Pony. Um, and also on Double Fantasy for John and Yoko. Uh, Denny Seibel would join Wings. George Martin is doing orchestral arrangements on two tracks, but interestingly, he doesn't, interestingly, doesn't even get credited. So I don't know if this is a reaction of Paul not wanting to be associated with George Martin or his Beatle past, but uh, he doesn't even get a mention. And interesting, Richard, Richard, interestingly, Richard Hewson doesn't even get a mention on wildlife, having even having done the string arrangement for Dear Friend. So that's that. Um, so uh, the book is very interesting in terms of, you know, they Paul booked the studio for the whole day quite expensively, but didn't turn up till 5 p.m. And the, the, the some of the engineers or the producer was getting pissed off at this kind of behavior. And Paul said, no, I don't want anyone else using the studio. And apparently EMI was shocked when they saw how much time Paul had been spending in the New York studio and said, oh dear, who's going to fit, who's going to foot the bill? And it's a bit unclear who did foot the bill, but the rumour is, the book says, the best, the most likely scenario is that it, Paul just billed it to Apple because <laughs> he just won the court case. Um, and although Apple was in receivership, um, he was still contracted to Apple and he did, wasn't getting his money freed from Apple. So um, he probably thought, well, I've, Screw it! I'm going to I'm going to charge Apple for this, and probably partly to get his own back for Apple spending lo lots of money on Yoko solo albums at the time. And <coughs> who knows? Anyway, um, as we've said, there are a few digs at Lennon on this album, particularly too many people preaching practices. Don't tell them. What, don't let them tell you what you want to be. Um, there's a song called Three Legs, which is pretty obviously about the other three Beatles, in my opinion. Uh, my dog he got three legs your dog he got none so it was John and George in particular sort of were quite offended by um, having said that dear boy I uh, guess you never knew what how much you missed uh, is not a, a, aimed at John it's actually aimed at Linda's first husband um, who later would sadly commit suicide um, Monkberry Moon Delight the book was very interestingly saying that it, John, Paul was doing kind of Lennon-esque parody vocal wise and I hadn't really thought about it like that but yeah I guess and also sort of not just vocally but coming up with kind of nonsense lyrics a la I am the walrus and I thought that was interesting um, provocatively on the last song Paul is singing we believe we can't be wrong and I think he's admitted that was kind of aimed at John and the client the pro client camp uh, but John didn't miss that one, and obviously he famously came out with his uh, immense dig at Paul in the form of How Do You Sleep from the Imagine album. Now, he, it's interesting that when he re wrote the song How Do You Sleep, he was quite angry, but by the time he got around to recording it, it was just a song, and his anger had subsided, and by the time the album came out, 
he was actually trying to play it down. And uh, actually, shortly thereafter, phoned up Paul McCartney and says, I hope you weren't too hurt by the song. So that's all interesting. So anger doesn't last forever. That's the lesson learnt there, I think. Um, no, two, the picture on the back cover of two Beatles copulating here. <clears throat> now, Paul McCartney, in some fairly recent interview, has said, we just thought it was an interesting picture. And, uh, of course, when the album came out, everyone was reading stuff into it. Well, I don't believe that for one second, that Paul was not aware of what he was doing or the message, how it would be received. Because even if he didn't notice it in the stone state he was in when he put the album jacket together, someone would have pointed it out to him, surely. Two Beatles copulating, how could that not be construed any other way than, than a, a dig at his ex-bandmates? And I think... That was a bit of revisionism on Paul's behalf, or maybe his memory is selective and he can't remember at the time what his thinking was. But uh, I think that's pretty distasteful. I, if I was Paul, I would not have put that picture on the cover. I don't think it's amusing. I don't think it's even yeah clever or anything. Anyway, um, that's that. Uh, the actual artwork is, is quite fun, I suppose. Uh, put, again, homemade. And uh, the gatefold, again, homemade, sort of sort of nursery school sort of type affair put together, put maybe a bit of help from the kids. Um, it's quite, quite, an, quite an appropriate name for the album, Ram, meaning that the, like a battering ram, ramming on, um, you know, in the face of adversity, you just keep on going and... The, the male sheep is called a ram and Paul was for, just acquired a farm in Scotland not so long before and he was suddenly in charge of a whole load of sheep and uh, so it's appropriate in many respects. Um, as for the title, as for the tracks, well I've always thought that ram is not perfect. <clears throat> I think when, it, when it's good it's extremely good. I like too many people I think it's a 10 out of 10 track. I think Uncle Albert is a masterpiece. I think Heart of the Country is just gorgeous. And I told Paul that, that I really liked that song when I met him in December 1997 at the BBC after the filming of Going Live, the BBC uh, Saturday morning programme. And he goes, oh, you like that one, do you? As he walked away, he said that back to me. Um, I Eat at Home, I think, has always been top draw for me. Backseat of My Car has a decent melody but suffers from a bit of a cluttered and sort of messy production. Um, Dear Boy, I think it's very clever, very good, very good vocals. Ram On is just a perfect little ditty written on the uke. And Three Legs is quite an adventurous song. I really like Three Legs. Really good guitar from Dave Spinoza. But, you know, I have tracks on here which I don't particularly like, like Smile Away, I have no time for. A lot of people love that track. Uh, I don't. Long Head Lady. You know, okay, nice love song maybe, but I, I don't like the track. I think it's overly long and overly sentimental. And particularly the ending just gets on my nerves. And uh, he's, he's trying to repeat. He's kind of, you know, to George was parodying Hey Jude with Isn't It a Pity? So Paul thought, well, I can do that as well. So he parodies the same type of ending with Long Haired Lady and it just goes on too long. That's all I can say about it. Um, anyway, uh, the several tracks laid down in the sessions which didn't make the album, which have seen the light of day since, for example, on the archive set and on various bootlegs. I Lie Around was a B-side in 73. Uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly turned up on Red Rose Speedway. Little Woman Love was a B-side in 1972. Hey Diddle turned up in the 90s, I think. Country Dreamer was a B-side in 73. Uh, a Love For You was a bootleg track, was supposed to be on Hot Hits and Cold Cuts, the famous w Wings bootleg, Never Saw the Light of Day. Uh, went through various incarnations, but there's a version of it on the Ram Archive edition. Great Cock and Seagull Race is quite an interesting blues workout. Road All Night is a bit forgettable. Um, so I, I think this album has a lot to recommend it. And also, this is a very good companion piece made secretly by Paul McCartney under the pseudonym Thrillington um, with an orchestra with the strings arranged by Richard Hewson, the same guy who'd done the strings for Long and Winding Road. 
for let it be. But Paul sort of differentiated between Phil Spector making the decision to over orchestrate it and Richard Hewson, who actually executed and did the arrangement. He sort of forgave Richard for that, although he never forgave Phil Spector for having the idea in the first place. But anyway, this is Ram. I think it's one of Paul McCartney's most interesting and innovative works. It really, it really does, has lasted the test of time. And particularly Linda's contributions now are well thought of, whereas at the time people sneered, probably. But I was too young to, to hear it at the time it came out. But anyway, I love it now. And that was Ram. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.